After more than 30 years of political and military struggle for independence from Ethiopia, Eritrea, a strategically located country in the Horn of Africa, has won its freedom. Subsequently, through a national referendum, the Eritrean people overwhelmingly voted in favour of independence and sovereignty. To observe and verify the fairness and impartiality of the entire referendum process, the United Nations dispatched an observer mission to Eritrea, known as UNOVA, or the United Nations Observer Mission to Verify the Referendum in Eritrea. Our guest today has a special interest in the Eritrean referendum. He's Samir Sandbar, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Chief of the UN Observer Mission to Verify the Referendum in Eritrea. A national of Lebanon, Mr. Sandbar, will be interviewed here at United Nations headquarters in New York by Ian Steele of the Press Foundation of Asia, Yvette Collimore of Interpress Service, and René Slama of AFP. Before we talk with Mr. Sandbar, let's look at some aspects of the Eritrean referendum. Our correspondent, Lelele Laulu, reports. Adonej Gegrikistos lost her husband and a son and daughter in the 30-year Eritrean struggle for independence. Every week, she throws an offering onto the hulks of two Eritrean tanks, a memorial to those martyred in the battle for the port of Massawa. Tens of thousands died in Africa's longest armed liberation struggle. These are the remains of Ethiopian and Eritrean soldiers said to have been executed by the army of the former dictatorship. The conflict devastated much of Eritrea's economy. War and two famines has meant that trucks carrying food provided by the World Food Programme are a familiar sight. 75% of the population still depends entirely on emergency relief. The end of the war in 1991 brought new hope to Eritrea. Early this year, United Nations observers began arriving to monitor a referendum on whether Eritreans wish to become independent from Ethiopia. In the days before the referendum, UN monitors visited communities like the village at Nefasset. They met with local religious and political leaders and observed election officials demonstrating voting procedures. An enlarged team of international monitors, UN officials, diplomats and election experts were brought in for the referendum itself. Briefing the enlarged United Nations monitoring force, Chief Electoral Officer Nguyen Hu Dong stressed that for many Eritreans, this would be the first time ever that they'd exercise their right to vote in a secret ballot. At such a critical point in the referendum process, the details are crucial to the success of the United Nations monitoring mission. On the morning of the first day of the three-day referendum, long lines formed even before the polls opened. For Mohammed Bashir, it was an emotional moment. This is the happiest day for everybody here in Eritrea. This is the day of freedom in Eritrea. This day is the feast of all Eritreans. Across the country and in Addis Ababa and the Sudan, where hundreds of thousands of Eritrean refugees remain after being displaced by the long war, UN observers reported a patient and enthusiastic turnout. <laughs> Among the first to cast his ballot, Asiasis Averki, Secretary General of the Provisional Government of Eritrea. This uh, historic moment in terms of Eritrean history, means uh, uh, a resolution of uh, a long-standing conflict in Africa. And in the African context, it uh, has its implications in terms of uh, UN role to uh, resolve uh, conflicts in a democratic manner. The final result of the referendum, an overwhelming majority, more than 95% in favor of independence from Ethiopia. The United Nations has officially declared the referendum free, fair and impartial. Within months, after 30 years of liberation struggle, Eritrea is expected to take up its place in the family of nations. 
Mr. Sambor, the United Nations has gotten more and more into the business of um, monitoring and supervising and organising referendums and elections, uh, not always with um, 100% success. Angola comes to mind, and of course, in the case of Western Sahara, the proposed referendum has yet to be arranged because of a number of difficulties. What is the secret of your great success in Eritrea? Thank you very much. It's not up to me to to uh, analyze the, uh, the secret of the success. But I think we tried very hard to uh, reach out to as many public audiences as possible. Uh, I and my colleague visited every region and talked to every group of people there, the elders especially, the old villages, the elders. And uh, we also uh, depended very much on the media to help us out because uh, the people in this country have not voted for at least 50 years. I mean, there is no voting memory there. Uh, Did so they have to be taught how to vote? Did you not, give them no, training? Not really, <laughs> no, no. But we tried our best really to let the average voter realize that he or she has a right to vote. So we tried to intensify the sense of free choice in the uh, potential voter because it was very important after so many years that the voter realizes that they have a right to choose and this is their destiny. They're playing a role in choosing their destiny. And it was really very uh, a feeling of elation to feel that somebody in a village, in a faraway town, realizes that they instinctively have a right to really decide their future. And they really played a very, very pivotal role in having our mission uh, work to a satisfactory outcome. You had a fairly small mission, and the whole operation cost only, I think, about $2 million, which these days is a drop in the bucket. How did you manage to uh, do it so economically? Well, I would think that uh, we had a very cost-effective mission, and uh, we uh, originally were given, I think, $3 million, which we cut down to about $2 million and, uh, in fact, $1,800,000. And uh, partly we tried to do several things. One is... Uh, that we try to depend very much on the UN offices uh, and agencies in the neighborhood. You know we have about uh, 300,000 Eritreans outside Eritrea. And uh, instead of like spending funds to observe there, we tried very much to, of course, enlist the UN information centers and the other UN offices like the ECA and Addis Ababa and so forth to ensure that we're not spending much money on overhead. And much ECA, that's the Economic Commission for Africa. For Africa, that's yeah. right. Mm. Uh, in Sudan, of course, there was 150,000 voters. We had to mobilize the diplomatic community, the United Nations offices, and so forth. And in the region, really, we mobilized the UN agencies and our UN offices. That was one aspect. The other one is that we tried to improvise as much as possible on a daily basis to see how we can save the expenses, but not take too many risks, because we had to make sure that the safety of our staff uh, is really uh, fairly covered. And uh, we tried to merge posts. For example, the post of, for example, information officer, uh, which, was a, which was put there, was not utilized because uh, me and one of my colleagues were you know, having a background in public information, so we could save on that one. Hmm. Uh, we tried our best to see how best we can, we can save funds, and I think we did. Ian Steele. Mr. Samba, where do we go from here? The uh, referendum is over. Eritrea has applied for membership of the United Nations. There's an opportunity for the role of the UN to expand once uh, they're accepted. That's an automatic. Uh, the question of um, aid is, is the big one for Eritrea. It needs just about everything after 30 years of war. How, how do you see the relationship evolving and, and what are the other prospects for the UN in Eritrea from here on? There is the concept of what the UN Secretary General, Dr. Boutosali, called post-conflict peace building. Now, I think this comes into play here. It is very important that the dynamics of Eritrea uh, be utilized to allow the UN to play a pivotal role in the reconstruction of Eritrea itself and also in having a peaceful impact on the countries of the region. Uh, this is why I think the United Nations could and most, most probably will play an important <laughs> role in reconstruction efforts. But this it could only do through a unified United Nations presence and an integrated United Nations approach, meeting the priorities of the country, because there is no point sending different UN missions and different UN agencies playing different roles there. 
it has to be a unified presence and an integrated approach because we have already built a very solid basis of relationship between the United Nations and Eritrea. I think we've started a new era between the United Nations and, and Eritrea, and I think it will be very important to build solidly on that basis and a unified presence, an integrated approach, meeting the priorities of the country itself is very important. What would be the most obvious uh, move from here? Would the United Nations Development Programme act as the, uh, as the, the central agency? Uh, would, you, would you see uh, a question of, of budgets uh, being resolved fairly quickly, getting aid into Eritrea? Well, I think uh, that the Second General's uh, view is usually that there should be a unified presence not the United Nations Development Programme or UNICEF or WHO, they all are working together. Basically, it's a United Nations presence which utilises the capacities of all the members of the UN system to provide aid. So what kind of representation is up to the Secretary General? But the decision of the Secretary General is that they should be all unified in their presence and integrated in their approach so that they can meet the priorities of the country. If already now they are talking about this already. Mm -hmm. Yvette Kolibor. Mr. Sandbar, in, in the whole aspect of post-conflict, um, you know, peace building and that sort of thing, is the UN considering any projects with, its, with Eritrea and its, its um, neighbours, for example, I suppose most significantly um, Ethiopia? Is there any programme that would maintain the peace? Well, think? I had discussed that matter uh, in what I would call the referendum plus, because, of course, our job was to verify the referendum. But uh, while there, you cannot help but have discussions and consultations with the government officials of uh, more than one country, especially Ethiopia, because uh, on the way in and on the way out, I stopped, of course, discussed with the Eritrean and Ethiopian officials the various aspects of the operation there. And uh, there seems to be readiness on, on both the Eritrean and the Ethiopian side to uh, review and discuss projects of possible interest to both of them. And I would think that the UN could really help in encouraging projects which could create a vested interest in peace. And if there are certain projects like utilization of ports and uh, resources and infrastructure which could build on the peace process, I think uh, the UN will be playing a very useful role. Is there any program that is being thought of at the moment? Um Seeing that, that Ethiopia is now a landlocked um, country, and I think they they may be discussing the use of force between each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, our colleague in the UN uh, Economic Commission for Africa and myself have been discussing with the uh, Ethiopian officials uh, the prospects of cooperation in these areas. And I had also discussed the, with the Eritrean officials such prospects. And I think there is an uh, an ECA. Economic Commission of Africa delegation, which is already now in Eritrea from uh, Addis Ababa, to see what sort of projects could be done. But I think it's a very important question. I think creating a vested interest in peace is a very important ingredient in creating an atmosphere of peace in the region. Mm -hmm. The programme is World Chronicle. Our guest is Samir Sanbar, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Chief of the UN Observer Mission to verify the referendum in Eritrea. René Slama. It seems that independence was possible because uh, present leaders of Eritrea and Ethiopia were in agreement. What would happen if there was a change of power in Addis Ababa? Do you think that uh, a resumption of the conflict is possible? Well, I, I'm not entering into any analytical uh, review here, but basically I think that a dynamic of peace has just been initiated through a very clear and free expression of the will of the people of Eritrea. And uh, I, as I said, stopped in uh, Addis Ababa on the way out after the referendum, and the <coughs> Ethiopian officials uh, expressed uh, satisfaction at the work of the United Nations uh, at the referendum. Basically, it seems to me that if we start this process of peace, it could go through a, and you create vested interest in peace. It will be in the interest of both peoples, not just the governments, to cooperate together. Not just both governments or both people, but I would suggest that the people of the region, because you're creating an atmosphere of peace in the whole region. And I'll give you an example. We had Eritreans in 
other countries, not just Ethiopia. Ethiopia, we had about 60,000 voters, voters, not citizens, but voters in Ethiopia. You had 150 voters in Sudan. You had about 38,000 voters in Saudi Arabia. And our work to facilitate the voting created an atmosphere of peace between these countries and Eritrea. And the contacts with the various countries of the region had created that sort of atmosphere, which I would hope would continue. Rene, you have another question? Yeah. Mr. Uh, Afewaki, who will become the president of the newly uh, independent state, uh, has been often described as a pragmatist. Can you yourself describe his personality? Uh, and also, it seems that he is reluctant to announce a timetable for elections. Why? Well, I... Uh, would just say that I had met Mr. Afwaki on several occasions, of course, since my arrival. And um, he has been very helpful in facilitating our work, him and his colleagues in the government. Uh, he uh, had very clear uh, concept of what the UN was doing in the past, what the UN actually did in Eritrea now, and how the UN could perform and help Eritrea in the future. And he put that in writing to the Secretary General. Uh, I think Mr. Afwerki, as far as I gather from conversation with him, feels that the UN could play a pivotal role now. Uh, it did in the referendum. Uh, his uh, uh, symbolic gesture of getting in my car to go to vote and come back uh, in a UN car symbolized his new perception of the United Nations. Um, at the same time, he seems to be keen of the changes of today's world and the role to play, and he seems to be indicating a, a great interest in a peaceful role for Eritrea. And he keeps repeating that, that uh, Eritrea is capable and could play a peaceful role with its neighbors. But so what about elections? Thing. You think no. that he wants to organize elections, and do you think the UN could play a role in parliamentary elections? Well, that is something for the future, I don't really know. I mean, all I know is that there is this dynamics of peace, and there is an interest in having the UN play a role in the reconstruction of Eritrea, and uh, the UN stands ready to help in any way possible. Ian Steele. Has there been any significant increase in, in aid for Eritrea or promises of assistance since the referendum? And who, who is administering aid to Eritrea at the present time? It was managed through Ethiopia prior to the referendum. Who, who, is, who is handling that? Well, from the national side, there is a Ministry of Economic uh, Cooperation which is dealing with that, and of course the whole government is dealing with that. But you have uh, struck a, a right chord in saying that there is yet to be defined uh, as to who is providing this uh, assistance to Eritrea. I think this is where the UN could play a very important role. Uh, many uh, donor countries are exploring the options of providing support to Eritrea. In fact, many countries have been calling a few days before the referendum to double-check when are we going to announce our evaluation so that they can start their uh, action, whether in the question of recognition or uh, taking diplomatic and, and financial and economic uh, steps. Uh, the World Bank had sent a, a technical team. Uh, many uh, member states, donor countries, have already sent their, mem their teams to mm -hmm. see what could be done. Uh, the United Nations, of course, the Secretary General is considering taking measures to help there. So we are starting something, which I hope would evolve into a more definite and, and uh, clear uh, result. Well, demo oh, democracy sorry. is sort of dangling like a carrot out there at the present time, uh, as, as we, uh, uh, we tried to get out in the earlier question, and donors are, are ha ha um, treating it as a contingency. There, there are no signs of which direction um, uh, the administration will go, and the day-to-day -day decision making is obviously a, a big question. This is an enormous, um, uh, enormously complicated internal and external process, and just who is managing the day-to-day -day is, is is in question. Uh, are you, you confident that, uh, that they have the capacity to handle the kinds of uh, resources that they're going to need in, in the construction of the, of the present administration? Well, they, they, they have struggled over 30 years with persistence and patience to uh, attain their goals. They seem to be a dynamic people. They seem to be knowing what they want to do. 
uh, they seem to be pragmatic. Uh, they uh, are open to the rest of the world. I think that the Secretary General of the provis Provisional Government had indicated that they are open for uh, a multi-party system for the future. He's announced that in two press conferences already. He's made it known to the media when he ever met with the international media. And um, there is, I think, a opportunity that they could do as well as other countries did when they got their independence, given the chance, given the hopefully, break. Uh, hopefully better than a few we could think of. Yes. Mm. Yvette Collymore. Mr. Sangler, how is uh, Eritrea hoping to attract all these hundreds of thousands of, of its people outside of its borders? Is there a, a, a repatriation program that the UN is assisting with? Well, I think there are three elements there. One is the refugees who had been, in a way, forced out during the war. Uh, and the repatriation is where the UN could play a role. The other ones are the, the uh, brain drain in the future, the professors and the people who could come back and play a role in the rebuilding of the country. And this is a question for them and their own government to discuss. And the third element are the Eritreans who are somewhere and would like to stay somewhere. And that is a personal choice. But on the first issue, the refugee question, the UN is playing a, an important role, an increasingly important role now, to see how they could be repatriated. And this is a, one of the main projects between the United Nations and the Eritrean authorities. And is, are there any, are there any ex, is there any expertise that the UN could, could, could assist with? Well, in the, the program originally was the UN High Commissioner for Refugees was dealing with that question. And now the United Nations Department for Humanitarian Affairs has taken it over with the participation of UNDP and the High Commissioner for Refugees and UNICEF. And um, they have built a timetable now. And they have a project which they actually did propose. And it's under discussion now. And there's a meeting of the donor countries in the future to discuss how best you could implement the program and get funds for it because you have about 500,000 in Sudan alone, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you have to see how you can get them back. So this is a question where you need lots of funds and where donor countries could play a role and where the UN could play a practical role by proposing an actual project. Rene Slama. It has been reported that the present leader, uh, Afwerki, has established a good relation with Israel. What is your information about his contacts with Arab countries? Are there any problems, any tension? Well... The, among the first few countries to recognize Eritrea were Egypt, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia. What is the extent of influence of Islamic organizations in Eritrea? Well, this was not part of my operation there. But from uh, your but, knowledge. Uh, my, my, my guess is yeah. that there is a national consensus about the independence. I did not see uh, any... Um, religious undertones throughout my stay, which was about three months. My main uh, notice was of a emerging national consensus. Uh, the sheikh, the archbishop, the amba, the orthodox uh, amba, which is the archbishop, and they all jointly called for the referendum, called for participation. Uh, I did not notice much of uh, uh, religious undertones. In fact, what you notice and what all observers noticed is that emerging national consensus on the question of their free choice. Ian Steele. What, what are the country's uh, economic prospects? We, we hear of uh, fisheries, uh, we hear of tourism, development of oil and gas uh, offshore. Uh, in practical terms, that's going to require outside assistance. Has there been any negotiation or discussion prior to the referendum um, which would point to the future relationships and who, who will exploit those resources? Well, <clears throat> first, there's uh, the UN interest, which is uh, now growing some priorities, including the fisheries, including rehabilitation of people who have been fighting for a long period, including natural resources, including the infrastructure, communications, and so forth destroyed by war. <clears throat> the other element is the bilateral uh, government to government uh, relations, and some already are exploring that possibility. The third one is the <clears throat> private investments, and that is the delicate question because they have to clarify what sort of regulations apply. Now, 
I think uh, the the you have mentioned some of the aspects. The the mm -hmm. marine resources is very very p potential mm -hmm. area. Then uh, of course there are areas which are very fertile in the mountain. They used to grow their own vegetables, uh, their own fruits, and there are still uh, destroyed grape vines. If you can start them again, they will come again to life. There is also some lots of um, uh, orange groves which could be uh, utilized more effectively. They are still primitively, but they could be helped out. Uh, there is the uh, area of uh, potential servicing like tourism and so forth. So there are lots of areas to be developed. But as you know, the country has been ravaged by war for 30 years, which destroyed not just it, its infrastructure like roads and telephones and so forth, but the actual you know, servicing. So there is uh, lots of possibilities, but they need to have the initial help. You have to give them the right seeds and the right funds to start them going. But they seem to be very keen on, on going. Mr. Samba, that's all the time we have. Thank you for being such an interesting guest and joining us on this, this edition of World Chronicle. Our guest has been Samir Sanbar, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Chief of the UN Observer Mission to verify the referendum in Eritrea. He was interviewed here at United Nations headquarters in New York by Ian Steele of the Press Foundation of Asia, Yvette Collimore of Interpress Service, and Renee Slama of AFP. I'm Michael Littlejohns. Thank you for joining us. We invite you to be with us for the next edition of World Chronicle.